All right, where are we going to start? Well, we will start this day with consciousness. What is consciousness? Uh, how does it work? Where did it come from? And then we're going to go into virtual reality. So those are kind of the two subjects for this morning. Both of these subjects will require you to take a, a pretty, a couple of large steps in your conceptualization of reality. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with my work or have read things, but if you're here for the first time, this will probably, you know, be kind of what, you know, what did he say? Uh, it'll sound a little, uh, a little wild and crazy. I won't be able to give you all the details of how we get, how I got to these ideas because we just don't have the time for that. Matter of fact, our schedule looks to be very tight. And I would rather talk less and give you more opportunity to ask questions because I think that's where a lot of the real learning is gonna come from when you get to ask your questions. Right now, the question times are a little small. Actually, today's question times are larger. Tomorrow and the next day, they, they get even smaller. So let's, uh, let's get started. on this, this day of, uh, of, of overload. First of all, I introduce myself a little bit. Uh, how is it that a physicist came to talk about consciousness? That seems like an odd thing altogether. I am a physicist, uh, did my graduate work in experimental nuclear physics, and have spent 35 years uh, as an applied physicist uh, working various jobs. Uh, Mostly uh, in the last decade or so, I worked as a consultant. So that, uh, that's been my career as a physicist. I've worked that, in that capacity for now, I guess probably uh, close to 35, 40 years. I'm retired now, which is good news. Now I work harder than I used to, as most retirees do, I guess. So I was, a, I was a, a physicist just out of graduate school, and I had learned how to meditate while I was in graduate school, and I found out while I was in graduate school that meditation had some very interesting um, properties. I found I could debug computer code very quickly in an altered state of consciousness that took me hours and hours to do if I were doing it with my intellect. I could just close my eyes, kind of go through the program, and there would be the problem. It would just stand out like in glowing lights. You know, that's, that's the line. You know, we're talking about large programs with you know, 100,000 lines of code in them, and there's one place where a comma should have been a semicolon, and that's what's bombing the program, you know, this sort of thing. So it's very hard to find these, these things. And it would take days if you were doing it with your intellect. I could do it in minutes in a meditative state. So that surprised me. And that started my interest in consciousness. That's kind of where I first got interested in it. I knew something very fundamental was going on. Well, I got out of graduate school. And very soon after that, my first job, I, I ended up meeting Bob Monroe. Bob Monroe wrote the books Journeys Out of the Body, uh, Far Journeys, and Ultimate Journey. He was a man that had um, spontaneous out-of-body experiences. At least that's what they're called. And he had just built a lab to study consciousness. I happened to run into him at that time and happened to be a scientist. He was looking for some scientific help, so we made a deal. Myself and, and Dennis Menerick and others would be his scientists. We'd, we'd work his lab, we'd build the equipment, we'd do the experiments, and he would teach us what he knew about the larger consciousness system. My going in attitude was, well, I'm gonna find out whether this is real or whether this is just a bunch of baloney because I'm a hard-nosed 
physicist, right? Left brain, dominant uh, kind of guy back then. And I was very skeptical, but I was open to trying and seeing what happened. Well, two or three years later, after spending 20 hours a week with Bob Monroe, I no longer had that question, is it real? I was able to verify, even with my skepticism, I was able to verify that indeed what Bob Monroe was doing and what he was teaching us to do was in fact real. By real, I mean that we, we did many, many experiments that are evidential, like the remote viewing experiments. You go someplace and look and then go see if that's actually what was there. Um, you know, reading numbers in a sealed envelope. Uh, we practiced healing with our minds. We just Anything that the consciousness could do, we practiced it and then we collected evidence. Were we really having an effect? Were we just fooling ourselves? So years of this, we collected lots of data and the statistics said that it was like one in 100,000 that the things that we had done and the information we've gotten was just chance. So scientifically, my intellect said, this is real, here's the data. At a deeper level, I said, eh, I'm not so sure. I don't know how it worked. What's going on? Maybe, you know, there's some other mechanism. It was very hard for me to grasp the fact that this is real. You know, there is this other dimension to our reality. Well, I did have an experience that just kind of was my, you know, kind of the shock into the, into the this is real. And uh, if you've read part of my book, you, under, you know that this is when myself and a person I was working with, we did this out-of-body trip together. And we were entirely isolated physically. And our, what, what we experienced was recorded. And after the session was over, we came back to the control room and Bob turned on the two tapes that was recording us individually. And here we were having conversations with each other, seeing the same things, going to the same, you know, had the same places, met the same people, had done all of this stuff in a non-physical reality. And <clears throat> it was two people who were obviously together doing this. And at that point, you know, it was like, my God, this is real. And I repeated that for probably two weeks and eventually got over it and that was the end of my my questioning whether or not it was real. But now that opened up a whole nother set of questions. Given that this is a real phenomenon, how does it work? What are the limitations? What can you do? What can't you do? You know, it's just a big unknown. Well, I'm a scientist, I'm a physicist, and what we do is model reality. And I didn't have a clue. So I started reading everything that I could get my hands on and did, starting to do experiments myself in this larger consciousness system. By then, I could go to this larger, I could get out into this larger consciousness system, or you might say get out of body or whatever, get out of mind, you know, you, you just open to the larger system. And I could do that at will, I could come and go. It was very easy for me after a few years with Bob. So I started doing experiments there with how it worked. What is its physics? What's the causality? And 30 some years later, I thought I understood it well enough to write it down in some books. And those are the books of my big toe. So basically that's the result of 35 years of learning and trying to figure out what's going on here and why is it going on. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is basically what I found out and you know, how it works. Now this is a model, okay? This is a model of reality. Now like any model, um, you shouldn't believe in it. You, know, you don't believe in models. You don't disbelieve in models. You just, the model is a structure to help you understand how things work. It's the way we can talk about it so that it makes sense. Okay, this is, this is the model. So let's start with consciousness. 
What is consciousness? Consciousness is information, just information. A good way to understand that is to think, what is your, what are you conscious of? What's your awareness now? What is it? Well, it's acoustic vibrations rattling your eardrum. It's light going into your eyes. And what happens after it goes into your eyes and into your eardrums? Well, the light goes into your eyes, it focuses to the retina, and the retina produces little electrical impulses, little bleeps. What's that? That's information. You see different things, you get different little bleeps. Okay, then it travels down the optical nerve and gets into your brain and at the vision centers, and you get neurons firing, patterns of neurons. You see? What's that? It's just information. So your reality here, all of your senses, just reduced to little electrical signals, bleeps, patterns of neurons, data. Wow. Data. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's your first clue that reality is just information. Okay, now if you were to if you were to somehow get in the perfect sensory deprivation tank and you had no sensory information whatsoever, all of that got cut off, what would you, what would you be aware of? You couldn't see, hear, smell, sense of touch, nothing. What would, what would be there? Just your awareness. I exist, I am. That's the only thing that would be there, you see, would be you. Nothing else. You'd be floating in the void, a point of consciousness. That's what's left when you get rid of their, your information. Okay, now it's just another step of logic to say, well, okay, I'm in this, I'm in this chamber, and what if all those little bleeps of, of electrical signals that are generated by my sensory organs what if they were somehow fed to me while I'm in this, this sensory deprivation chamber? What would I see and hear then? Well, if all those little electrical signals are the exact same signals that you're getting now, you'd get this exact same thing. You'd be sitting there you know, on a table, you'd have writing in front of you, you hear me talking. In other words, the data, it doesn't matter really where it comes from, does it? It's whether or not you get the data at the central nervous system, you get this. Whether this is here or not, does it make any difference? It's just the data. You interpret that data to be this. Well, how did you get so clever as to be able to interpret a lot of little electrical signals and so on as this? You started learning that when you were born. When you first were born, you really didn't know what anything was in that environment. And it was a long, painful process to be able to interpret the data to be this. And how come we all interpret the data to be about the same? Well, we all grew up and had kind of similar environments, right? We ran into sky and water and trees and ground and people and parents, and we all had an experience in this physical reality. We all learned to interpret the data. Okay, so now what are we? We are a point of consciousness. And what is this physical body? It's, I guess one, the modern word to call it is it's an avatar. It's, think of the, think of, um, think of the uh, uh, video games that either you or your, your kids play, Sims, World of Warcraft, there's dozens of them out there where you're in a multiplayer video game. It's called virtual reality video game. All right, let's say you're playing the world of Warcraft and in that you have lots of strange beings like elves. So let's say you're an elf. That elf is your avatar. That elf is your body in that game. And you sitting there looking at the monitor with your hand on the mouse and the fingers on the keyboard, you are its consciousness, right? 
you're the one that says, jump, run, fight, you know, whatever it is you do, you know, get up and go to work. Whatever you want that elf to do, you're the consciousness. And it does what you command. You move the mouse and it moves. You type things in, it does. So you're the consciousness, it's your avatar. Now think of this physical reality. Here you are, you're just a point of consciousness floating in the void. Now you're gonna join this virtual reality game, reality game that we call our universe, our physical universe. Okay, now is there some, is there a difference here? Not really, your elf thinks he's in a physical reality too. That elf running around in World of Warcraft is in a physical reality from his viewpoint. It's got mountains, it's got trees. He can't walk through the tree, you know. If he runs into a tree, he bounces off. If he jumps off a cliff, he gets hurt. It's just like here, it's a physical reality to the elf. Now, the consciousness is, is you with the control, and that's just a data stream. The server that hosts that virtual reality game, that multiplayer virtual reality game, is sending a data stream to your computer. Your computer interprets the data, puts it on a screen, you get to look at it, and you're the consciousness. All right, so now imagine yourself, the consciousness, you're getting a data stream, and you interpret it as this. Okay, now well, that's like, what? You know, it's kind of crazy, right? That's called virtual reality, and it goes along with, with what I'm going to explain to you about consciousness. The two concepts, you kind of have to get them together. You know, you are consciousness. You. You the point of consciousness that would float in the void. That's what you are. You're getting a data stream. A data stream, every individual gets their own data stream, just like every player. There may be 10,000 players on the, on, in the server playing World of Warcraft or playing The Sims. All 10,000 or 100,000 of those players all get their own data stream. Each one gets an independent data stream, but they interact with each other. So those data streams, you know, interact. Your elf and somebody else's elf can, you know, work together or fight each other or do whatever. The consciousness makes those decisions. The avatar goes through the motions. So that's, the, that's kind of the concept that you are consciousness. All right, where did this consciousness come from? What is it? Well, we've just kind of decided that it's information. So now we think of consciousness as this information field. Consciousness is just information. Where might the, this virtual reality come from and where might the consciousness come from? Well, we'll start with an assumption that consciousness exists. That's not too hard, right? I mean, here we are, we're conscious, so we can say consciousness exists. It's not a real crazy assumption. The second assumption we need to make is that evolution exists. Evolution is just a process by which something that can change, changes, right? The something that can change means something that can, can grow, can become something other than it is, and if it becomes something other than it is that is helpful to it, that makes it better, that it, it sees that this is an improvement, then it stays. If it becomes something other than it is and that's not helpful to it, that's a, that's a, a detriment to it, that just goes away. It dies off. That's how um, evolution works. Now, all sorts of things evolve. We've learned about evolution of our planet and of, our, of the creatures on it. We know about Darwin's theory. But that's just one application. Evolution's a very general concept. Cultures evolve. Technology evolves. Corporations evolve. Most everything evolves. What do you know of in your life that's entirely static? that doesn't ever change. Almost nothing, right? Everything is evolving. If the changes are beneficial, 
they tend to, con they, they persist. If they're not, it goes away. That's evolution. So that's our second assumption. Okay, so we're just starting there. Let's just start then with consciousness as a potential awareness, something that can do no more than, than in its awareness. It, can, it has this sense of it can be in state A or state B. So it's this very, you know, it's not a, an intelligent thing yet. It's just a potential awareness. Again, we've just assumed this thing. Right, so where did that potential come from? We're not going there because we don't know. There's a limitation to knowledge, and I'll get to that earlier. You have to start with this assumption that consciousness exists. So you start with this potential that has nothing more than awareness of this way or that way. It's self-aware. It kind of knows that it exists because it can exist in one, and it can exist in some little different state, too. Well, if it can do that, then it can exist in state one and state two, and then state two and then state one. It can, what we're, what we're building up now is a binary system, right? We just have two states. Well, if it can, if it can do that, then it can maybe have a, a this way, this way, you know, and this way. It can maybe be in that state three times in a row. Now, we talked about three times in a row. What, is, what have we just assumed here? Time, right? We've assumed a very fundamental time when we say words like three times in a row or uh, this and that. Because first there's this, that's before, and then there's that, and that's afterwards. Before and after, we've defined some kind of fundamental sense of time comes in with our assumption of consciousness exists. Time also exists because otherwise it couldn't differentiate the state from that state. So there's, it's a before and an after. So this is where we're, we're starting. Now what does this thing do, this, this digital information system that just can distinguish this from that? It evolves. How does it evolve? Well, information theory comes up with a term called Entropy. Actually, before information theory used the word entropy, you know, physicists were using the word entropy uh, to uh, describe our universe. Very, a very quick definition of entropy is it's a measure of disorder. Okay, so the higher the entropy, the more disorder. So in an information system, what's the maximum amount of disorder? All your bits are random. There is no information. How do you get information? The bits have to become ordered in some way. There needs to be structure and order. If you have structure and order, then you have information. For instance, let's say here's, here's some structure. If I go up, down, up, down, up, what's the next one? Down, how did you know that? Because the pattern contained information. And once you understood the information of the pattern, you could project that pattern because you got the information, you see? So any kind of structure lowers the entropy. It's no longer random. Now it's up, down, up, down, up, down. That's not random. It's a sequence and it lowers the entropy. So information systems evolve by lowering their entropy which means creating content, creating structure, creating information. Now there's one other thing that we need, and that is we need a purpose, a point, a way to determine in this evolution is, is this better or is this worse? You know, in evolution, if it's worse, then we just let it go. If it's better, we keep doing it. Well, if you're an information system, what's, what's good? Information, right? Creating information, creating patterns, creating structure. This is what you do. And if you don't do that, what are you? Nothing. Random bits. So basically, if you have this glimmer of self-awareness that we started with our assumption of consciousness exists, 
it would evolve to create pattern, to create more of those this and that's, to create structure. And so it would evolve more and more structure, more and more patterns, and looking for ways to decrease its entropy, because that's its motion forward. Increasing its entropy is it dissolving away into randomness. So now's the system, we just have to let it evolve. What is it going to do? It's going to find patterns, patterns of patterns, patterns of patterns of patterns. The more complex, the more, the more structure it can find, then the more it becomes. It's evolving. Well, if you just have one thing trying to decrease its entropy, one thing trying to find novelty, new things, new patterns, new ways of constructing its bits, it comes to a limitation. It's, that's a very limiting thing. It's only what it can imagine, only what it can come up with. How do you, what's the next step in really decreasing the entropy? Well, biological cells had this same problem. We'll go to our biological uh, evolution and we'll see the same thing. You did have a cell. Now again, we start with that assumption. There was the first cell. You know, biologists will tell you, well, they had a couple of, you know, amino acids, some biochemicals, you know, formed. They just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Maybe a little electricity uh, from lightning or static charge or something, and they started to interact as a group. Ah, a cell. That first cell, right? And they can recreate that in a the lab. They can take those chemicals and put a little electricity through it. They can actually make things that are cells. So that's a good theory that that's what we had. So what happened, what did that cell do? It's the same thing. You see that cell isn't any different. In order to evolve, what could that cell do? Well, at first it just got itself together, right? Organized. Then, the next big step forward is it split. And now you had two cells. And now these cells could interact with each other. Do you see the immense uh, potential now for new novelty, more information, more structure? Because now they could interact. It wasn't just what each one of them could come up with, but what they could do together. You see, now you had a multi-celled creature. And these multi-celled creatures then evolved and evolved, and we had all the multi-celled things until they kind of topped out on what they were going to do. And what strategy did they come up with next? They came up with the strategy of specialization. Now in a multi-celled critter, you had the part that was the sensor part, the part that would move it, the locomotion part, the part that would defend itself, the part that would digest, you know, that sort of thing. You had the, the specialization of cells. So now you had this much bigger multi-celled thing that had specialized. Parts of the cells got very good at doing certain things and others got very good at doing certain things. Now, again, see all the, the increase in novelty? Suddenly there's a whole lot more ways that things could be structured than there was when there was just a couple of cells glommed together, which was a whole lot more than there was when there was just one cell. Well, now let's go back to consciousness. The consciousness, the evolution's evolution. Consciousness does the same sort of thing. So you've got this one consciousness system, patterns of patterns, it's existing because it has this extremely dim self-awareness of itself and of these bits, and it's evolving to be more complex. What does it do for the next giant step? It splits. Now, I don't mean it necessarily splits in half. It just makes two of what was one. It takes a part of it, and now there's two things that are very dimly aware, and they can interact with each other. Okay? Two things can now interact in whole new ways of complexity that didn't exist before. You got a whole new dimension to their reality. Okay? Now, that will continue. And just with the biological cells, it split again. 
and again and again, and it found out that the more it had all of these cells, the more interactions you could have. Now, there's one other concept that I haven't gotten into here yet, and that is that each of these pieces of this consciousness has to be independent. It has to be able to do its own thing. Otherwise, you don't get the novelty of the two pieces interacting. It's only that both pieces are, are independent that they create all this new ways of going together. Now they can explore and experiment in other ways, ways to work together. And so when you have these multiple things, they all have to be independent. What do we call that? We call that free will. It's the same with the biological cells. The biological cells, when they split and did whatever they did, each cell had to be independent. Otherwise, you don't bring anything new to the interaction. You see, they had to have ability to make their own choices. Okay, now we haven't gotten the intellect up high enough that we're really talking about intellectual choices, but at that point, you'd have biological choices and biological memory. You know, so you have, you have the, your memory's now just in biology. It's in structure. It's not in thinking yet. So here in consciousness, we have all these pieces of consciousness interacting with each other. And they begin to specialize too, because that's a way of reducing entropy. So we have a part that is kind of the, um, oh, what do we say, the um, executive leadership, right? In the, in the animal world, in our biological world, we maybe call that the central nervous system the kind of the controller, and we have all the other parts. And guess what? What are we, all of us individuated units of consciousness sitting here? We're one of those pieces. We're one of those consciousness cells, if you like. You see, that's evolved to be this complicated and this complex. So if you think about it and you say, well, wow, this is really complex. You know, a human being's got billions of cells and it's a really complex thing. Well, that wasn't put together or programmed or designed. That just evolved. Just like our consciousness just evolved. Went from something simple to something more complicated. Why? Because it moves to its purpose. What is its purpose? to stay alive, to create more novelty, to reduce entropy. So that's the purpose of an information system. So I'm kind of building a, a structure for you here. All right, so we have this information system and we have it broken into lots of pieces. And there is kind of an executive part, you might say the operating system, you know, if you like, because this is just an information system. And there's no distance here. You know, we're not talking about distance and, and mass and this sort of thing. This is just a potential system that, that has these attributes, this consciousness. So again, it gets kind of static because now you have pieces of consciousness that have awareness of their existence and awareness of others' existence, and they can communicate because that's what an information system does. It passes information. What's that information? Patterns and structures, and it can pass that, that information from one to another, all right? And they do that, and they evolve, and they become a lot of individual consciousnesses. But again, they're kind of stuck. Imagine what this would be like if you were, you know, one of those consciousnesses at that point in our evolution. It would be like being in a, in a big chat session where there were say 10,000 people in this chat room, okay? And there were no rules, no etiquette, just 10,000 people in a chat room, and they all could just send a message, receive a message. That's all they could do. They're just awarenesses out there that can exchange information. You see how limiting that is? You get the information, but you have no way to judge that information. Is that just, Craziness, you know, somebody making that up, is somebody, you know, who knows? So how do, you, how do you know what's significant, what you can learn from? Is there anything there that you can take in and actually 
grow with. Well, how can you lower your entropy getting and giving that information in this big monster chat room? See, it's very hard, right? It's a very slow way to go. So this system, as it evolves, came up with a solution. It said, what we need is a structure for our interactions. We need a rule set. We need, it, we need to put some protocols and some etiquette into our chat room. We maybe need avatars so we can look at each other. And these avatars need to express what we're thinking and what our feeling is, you see. Well, what's that? That's called a virtual reality. All a virtual reality is, is a set of rules about how data can be exchanged. That's what a virtual reality is. So when you're playing this World of Warcraft and you've got your elf out there running through the forest, what is it? There's no protocols and rules on what you can do, okay? Rules on what that elf can look like. You might want an elf with two heads, but sorry, you can't get an elf with two heads because the system only supports elves with one head, so you have to do that. There's rules. You can't run through that tree, you can't fall off that cliff, or you'll get hurt. If you drop into deep water, you'll drown. There's all these rules about energy exchanges, about how you interact with your environment and how you interact with each other, and you have to abide by the rule set. So now you've got a virtual reality, and this virtual reality now gives you a vast um, improvement in your ability to interact. You interact now with feedback. It's not just this disembodied piece of data coming to you and this, you know, you send a kind of a disembodied piece of information out and nobody knows really what to do with it. Now you've got interaction. You can affect each other and you can see the effect that you're having on each other. So you've got traction now, you've got feedback. And what does that do? Well, it helps you grow. It helps you learn, it, helps, it gives you all sorts of more complexity and novel things. Now you can start having an intellectual concept of who you are. You've created this duality now, it's you and the rest of the world. You see, you've got this duality and you interact with it and you want to decrease the entropy of your consciousness. That's what you want to do. You want to interact. So now we need to look at what does this mean? Decrease the entropy of your consciousness. What exactly are we doing there when we do that? Well, okay, think of a, we, here we are, this bunch of pieces of consciousness and we're interacting with each other. We have these rule sets so that we get some traction, we get some feedback and we know the rules of the game. Okay, so okay, where we want to go next with this, with this is it's a virtual reality trainer is what this is. It's a virtual reality trainer. And what is it training you to do? It's training you to decrease the entropy of your own personal consciousness. So the larger consciousness system, which is the whole information system, now has pieces, and these pieces are enrolled in this virtual reality game where they can evolve more quickly. Because as they evolve, the whole system evolves, right? As each one of these little pieces decreases their entropy, well, they're a part of the system. The whole system decreases its entropy. So you can think of it now as this virtual reality game is like a strategy of this larger consciousness system for evolving itself. It's like, oh, I found a better way to do this. You see, I found a more efficient way that we can lower our entropy. If you have a lot of individuated units of consciousness together, what do you have? You have a social system. Right? It's called a social system when you're interacting with other interactive beings and you're communicating with each other. All right, so how do you optimize entropy reduction in a social system? In other words, 
how does the social system grow, become more, more complex, more interactive, builds, grows, you know, produces more structure? What's the optimum interaction between these individual units to optimize that growth? Well, the answer comes out, love. Love is the optimal interaction mechanism between individuals to optimize the whole. Well, that may seem like I just made that up, but let's look at a little analogy. Let's think of two systems, two different systems. You have this social system A, social system B. Up here in social system A, that will be the love social system, and those people interact with caring for each other. Love, you see, is about other, not about self. Love is about others than you. Love is cooperative, it's caring, it's compassion, it's how can I help, what can I give? Okay, so we have a bunch of, let's say we have 10,000 entities in this system A, they're all gonna interact with each other, they have a certain number of resources to deal with, and they are a system of love. They all want to cooperate, they all want to help each other, they, they all care about the whole, about each other. So imagine, let them evolve. Give them 10,000 years to evolve, okay? What would you expect from that kind of a system? That's your optimal system. They're gonna, they're gonna build, they're gonna construct. They're going to create their own civilizations, their own cultures, and it's all gonna be based on how can I help? What can I do? Where can I serve? That will be your optimal. Now let's look at system two, system B. The opposite of love is fear. Fear is always about self. If you have fear, it's about you, your fear, you're afraid. It's all focused on you rather than focused on other. All right, in a fear-based system, we have the same 10,000 entities, we have the same resources, except now they're very fearful. Well, if you're fearful, you're worried about, all right, there's only a certain amount of resources and uh, I better make sure that I get my share and just in case, I think I ought to really get more than my share because you never know when you might need extra resources. So it's out for yourself, it's what about me? What, you know, how can I get stuff, get more of the resources, and then how can I keep it and keep somebody else from taking them away from me? How can I hold on to it? Well, there can't be any trust in that system because how can you trust? So everybody's out for themselves. Well, you can maybe form up into groups, kind of mutual defense packs, and you can say, all right, we'll stick together and we'll trust each other. and. Uh, you know, we'll stick together and that way we'll be able to get more stuff because we'll be more powerful. There'll be a bunch of us. And if group A forms up pretty soon, there's another group that's gonna form up to oppose that group. And this is what you get. If somebody else gets something, oh, here's a person had a really good idea and they build up some structure, what happens? Everybody else wants to take that structure. They wanna tear it down for a couple of reasons. One, they just like to have it. They didn't have to build it or come up with the idea, they just take it, now it's theirs. And secondly, they don't like the idea that somebody else has more than they do. Why should that person have that and I don't when I'm bigger and stronger, I can just have it. You see, this is based on fear. Well, imagine that 10,000 years later, what do they evolve to be? What do they become? That's easy, isn't it? They become just like us. They become just like, you know, you'll go turn on the news, you know, let's see what's going on in the world, and that's it, isn't it? That's what they become. We are consciousness, and we have a lot of fears. We're in this virtual reality trainer trying to grow up, which can be translated into become love, or to reducing our entropy. Why? Because that's how we evolve. Why do you want to evolve? It's either evolve or die. You either lower your entropy or the entropy increases and you eventually become nothing but random bits. You go away. So the system wants to evolve. The system is broken into lots of interactive pieces 
And the way these pieces can optimize their evolution is to interact positively, caringly with each other, okay? And because that's hard to do in a chat room where you have nothing but just disembodied pieces of information coming back and forth, you have this wonderful virtual reality where the rubber meets the road and you get to immediately see the impact of your choices. Now, just introduced a whole bunch of new ideas that all I know, you know, it's a, it's a head full to get this, this big picture, but I'm just introducing this kind of big picture of the way reality works. And we're gonna find out there's a lot of logical, um, logical uh, consequences of the things that I've told you. And though we're going to mostly do theory today just to kind of get you up on you know, what, what reality looks like and how it works, um, the next day and the day after that, we're gonna talk more about application. You know, what, does this, what does this mean to me? You know, what, what, you know, how do I proceed? And, and what's important for me to do and not do? So we'll get more to that tomorrow. This is kind of theory day, because if you don't understand the basic theory, then the rest of it doesn't necessarily make sense. So, um, so here we are, kind of painted this picture, this larger consciousness system. It's evolving. The pieces interact. It's more profitable for it. In other words, it furthers its evolution if these pieces interact by caring for each other than it does if these pieces are in conflict and trying to tear each other down. One system builds, creates, and becomes the other system, struggles, and every time a little something gets created, something else tears it back down again. It just doesn't seem to ever get very far. It's struggling all the time, and everybody in it is miserable because it's this fear-based thing. So that's our reality. That's virtual reality. And here you are, just a an avatar, a body, in this game, in this virtual reality entropy reduction trainer. And what's your job? What are you supposed to be doing here? You're supposed to be lowering the entropy of your consciousness. You're supposed to be becoming love. You're supposed to having spiritual growth. We can say it in all these different ways, right? They all mean the same thing. So it's, that's what we're here for. And why is that what we're here for? Because it's either grow up or self-destruct. It's very simple. So we're pieces of this larger system. Now there is an executive, you know, there's the, there's the central nervous system, if you like, of this system that is, that is uh, creating the virtual reality for us, that we are a part of it. So now let's kind of bring a couple of the things that you've probably heard. You've probably uh, all uh, um, maybe brushed up against some Eastern mysticism at one time or another, you know, looked at, uh, at Eastern concepts and even our Western concepts. So, you know, let's start with a Western concept. God is love, right? That kind of fits right in, doesn't it? Makes, makes good sense. Um, you go to Buddhism and they'll say, we're all one. Well, we are. We're all part of the same larger consciousness system. Sort of like uh, my fingers and my arms and my, my legs and feet, they're all part of me. They're different. The finger's not the same as the nose. They're all different. They have different functions, but they're all part of one thing. And hey, we all have to get along together because we can't like, you know, chop off the pieces and all go off and do our own thing. It doesn't work. The whole thing dies. So it's like that, we're a piece of this larger thing. We're all one. What does that mean? We can communicate with each other. We're all netted on this big net. It's a large network and we're all connected and not just all of us here, but all of us on this planet. And is it just the people? No, consciousness is consciousness. You know, your dog is conscious, your horse is conscious, you know. All sorts of things are conscious. 
the bumblebee that flies around, you know, and there's conscious, anything that can make a decision, anything that has a finite decision space, what I mean by that means they can make a choice. They have the ability to say, I could do this or that, I choose to do that. Anything that has that, even if it's just one choice, if they can make a choice, that defines consciousness. It's a conscious choice. So does a bumblebee make choices, or is it just entirely driven by its, you know, it's just a machine, a you know, biological machine, just driven by its whatever it does, you know, its instincts? Well, if you study critters, we used to think some time back that we were the only beings that were conscious and nothing else really was, right? That's not so. The more you study the small parts of, of the biological spectrum, like the bumblebees, you know, like the cats and dogs and everything else, the more you realize they do make choices. They do learn. You see, if you can make choices, you can learn. You can make a choice A and find out that was a bad choice. Now the next time you won't do that, you see. So anything you can make choices can learn. So we have consciousness all over, and it's all doing the same thing. That bumblebee also is supposed to make choices that lowers its entropy of its consciousness. It's no different than us. It's just that it has a very limited space in which it can do that. There's only a certain number of choices it can make. So it has a very simple problem. We have a very complex problem because we have so many choices that we can make. And most of the choices that I'm talking about here are the choices of how to be, how we are. It doesn't really matter whether we choose, you know, Coke over Pepsi, or whether we choose, you know, to sit in this chair or that, or, you know, what clothes we wear. I mean, we have all these choices we make, but that's really not the kind of choices. Those are part of our choices, and they're part of our expression of ourself, but I'm talking about the choices of who we are, our choices. Somebody annoys you, somebody says something rude to you, and you react maybe rudely back, and you think, they made me do that. So-and-so made me angry. You see, but so-and-so can't make you angry. You have to take responsibility. If you respond with anger because somebody did something nasty to you, that's your choice. You don't have to respond with anger. You could respond with caring, you see. One of them is fear-based, the other is love-based. So you have to make these choices about how you are and who you are, what your intent is, what motivates you. It's not so much about what you do as it is about why you do it. The ethics, the, the foundation of morality, the foundation of ethics falls right out of this, you see. If what you do increases your entropy, then that's wrong. That's on the wrong side of moral. If what you do decreases your entropy, that's on the high side of moral. If what you do is fear-based, you see, that's not helpful. If what you do is love-based, it is. So it's not so much what you do, as it is why you're doing it. What's it based on? Is it based on fear? Is it based on love? So from this same thing, see a logical, I said we'd have lots of logical consequences. Well, one logical consequence is, is morality and ethics. It's a logical consequence. We know what's good and what's bad. What's good moves us toward becoming love, moves us toward lowering the entropy of our consciousness. What's bad moves us in the other direction, you see? And the same act could be motivated by either one. I often use the example, if you see somebody walking down the street in front of you and you see that um, you know, a 500 peso bill falls out of their pocket and is on the street, okay? Now, if we're watching this happen, we say we're watching it happen and we see that the person comes, uh, picks it up and gives it back to the person. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they did that out of caring for that person and returning their property. They may have only been afraid 
that they would get caught stealing. Is there somebody around here that will see me run up and pick that off, and you know, pick that up and run off with it? Uh, you know, my, you know, my children watching me. Uh, you know, you know, somebody, gonna, you know, and well, I'd, I'd really like to have that, but you know, I don't think I should. It's not a good thing. You know, the intellect is in charge, so the intellect says I should give this back. Well, that's civilizing, but that's not growing. The person who is love-based just. There's no question. They don't have to think about whether they should do it. It's automatic. Oh, you dropped this here. You see, it's not, I, I'm doing this because I think I should do it because I've learned that's the better thing to do. That's a civilizing thing. That's your intellect talking. I'm talking about choice making at a, at a lower level. Our intent that drives those choices is at a deeper level than the intellect which now brings me to two other subjects, and that is we operate at an intellectual level and we operate at a being level. Okay. Our intellect is what we use to analyze and judge and assess, and our being level is just who we are. Now, all this growth I'm talking about, this becoming love, all this change and growing up, has to take place at the being level. If it only takes place at the intellectual level and you give that, that uh, 500 pesos back because you've been taught it's the right thing to do, that doesn't necessarily help you grow up any. You're not a better person for making that decision. You're just fear-based. You're afraid not to do it. You've been taught this is the right thing and you are really afraid not to do it. It'd be awful if I did that, you know. You, you would feel bad about yourself. It's a fear-based thing to do it through the intellect. It's a love-based thing to do it from the being level. So now we have a, a kind of a, a, a major change in philosophy saying that, that um, morality is not action-based. Morality is intent-based. And somebody will think, well, what if I think it's a good thing to do, but it's awful? You know, what if uh, some crazy fanatic think that it's really the best thing to do is to, you know, do some horrible thing? And he just thinks that way because he's mentally ill or whatever. Well, that's not the case. He doesn't really think that way. What, he, what he's doing is self-serving. He is doing it because that's the way he wants it. It's not about other. It's not about them. It's about him. Well, that's fear-based. And we call that ego. I know, I'm just dropping new ideas on you. You know, every two or three minutes, I'm dropping another idea on you, and it's going to build up, and pretty soon your heads will explode. But uh, stick with it, and we'll, uh, we'll get there. We'll go back through some of these ideas, uh, um, you know, again. And, and probably a couple of times before we're done. So you don't have to just get it all now. You know, we're going to repeat some of this in more detail. Later, I just want to give you an overview of what reality is really like, why reality is this way, where did it come from, um, what is our point and purpose of being here, and what it is we need to do to do what we're supposed to be doing. Okay, so I've kind of given you a rough idea of those things. We've talked a little about virtual reality. Okay, maybe let's talk a little more about virtual reality because it can be a very complex thought. If you're in a virtual reality, where did this virtual reality come from? Did somebody program it? You know, we have a virtual reality in the world of Warcraft and The Sims and these other things we play somebody had to go program it. So if in The Sims you have a lawn and there's grass growing in the lawn, that grass had to be programmed, you see? The sun rises and it gets daylight, and the sun sets and it gets dark. Somebody had to program all of that. So is our virtual reality, somebody programmed it? Did this executive function go out and program it? No, it's not programmed. It evolved. This virtual reality just evolved. How did it do that? Well, you start 
with some initial conditions and you start with a rule set, right? You always need a rule set. If you're going to make a game, you need rules. If somebody says, okay, let's go play a game. Ready, set, go. And there's no rules. What are you going to do? Nothing. <laughs> you can't, there is no game if there are no rules. So you start with a rule set and the initial conditions are that there's this tight little spot, very high pressure, very high temperature. Um, these are initial conditions. Okay, and you have this rule set that says how that thing, how those things interact, how all the little particles in there, whatever they are, how all this energy can interact, how energy can transfer. That's called our physics. The physics of the rule set, our science, our biology, you know, is, is derived from the rule set. And then what do you do? Well, you hit the run button. And when you hit the run button, the simulation starts and that high temperature and pressure begins to expand, and as it expands, there's parts of it that coalesce, and now you've heard this, right? It's called the Big Bang Theory, except this is the big digital bang because it's being done in a computer. Now, we have computer simulations like that where we simulate how this universe got started, you see? So it's just in a computer. So it's a simulation. The simulation goes on and it expands. You end up with suns, you end up with planets, and you end up with this particular sun and this particular planet, and you end up with conditions that could evolve life forms, like we said, with the cells, and the cells multiplied, and the, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and here we are. We are, we, our avatars, this virtual reality we're in, just evolved in a simulation. And you're thinking, well, that's really strange. You know, this is just a simulation. Well, it's continually evolving. It's still evolving. But the simulation has a rule set. And because of that rule set, we've evolved what we have. You know, we don't, we can't jump 20 feet in the air. We can't jump up and touch that ceiling. Why? Because the rule set evolved beings like us that just can't do that. It, would violate the rules that we don't have big enough muscles or legs, and if we did, that would cause us some other kind of problem. So, you know, the rule set also is trying to, you know, it kind of defines in the physical world what can exist and what can't. It has to follow the rules. Same way in the world of Warcraft, right? What that elf can do and what that elf looks like and so on are the rules of that game. It defines it. So this virtual reality just evolved. So think of this virtual reality as this evolved simulation. And here you are a consciousness. And you want to join this game because it kind of puts you on the fast track of evolution. You could just stay in the big chat game if you wanted to, but that gets pretty tiresome after a bit and you don't seem to be making much progress or going very far. So this the system let this virtual reality evolve and the virtual reality simulation cr creates the constraints by what our consciousness can do. Okay, you think about that. In the world of Warcraft, the rule set in the world of, uh, world of Warcraft creates the constraints that limits what the player can do how fast the elf can run, how tall he is, you know, and then you get things like, uh, you know, how many magic spells does he have, and, you know, how good is he, you know, with, in, in fights and things, whatever the World of Warcraft game does. All of those things are defined. And you, the consciousness, you just have to abide by the constraints defined by the computer about what your character can do and what it can't do and how it can interact with other characters and with the environment. We're the same thing. So we're a piece of consciousness. We're getting the data stream and the data stream has to abide by the, what this simulation, this virtual reality simulation, what the rules are, how things have evolved here. See, that means the rules have to be applied you know, um, you know, consistently. So this particular virtual reality has grown this universe and it has its rules and we have to abide by them. So we can't jump and touch the ceiling, you know? We can't, we can't learn 
quantum mechanics and uh, you know integral equations and you know vector analysis all in an hour. It's too much. Our brains aren't made to do that. So we have to take maybe months or years to learn all that stuff. When we grow up, we don't you know we don't grow up like a puppy, you know, and in six months we're almost an adult, you know, it's not like that. We got a lot to learn. We live in a very complex, very interactive world and there's so much to learn how to interpret. But the puppy is not like that. The puppy grows up in a much more limited reality, with much more limited choices. So that gives us another idea that we all live in our own personal reality. This idea that there's one big reality out there and then we just bang around in it, but it's separate from us, you see, is not the right idea. The idea is that this reality, to a large extent, is our own creation. Now, how does that work? Obviously, we just can't create whatever we want here, right? Or we all be, you know, good looking, rich, and famous. So, that obviously didn't work. So, you do have to you know, interact. And we have all these free wills interacting with each other, but you do create your reality in a few very significant ways. One is you interpret the data stream. How you interpret that data stream is entirely based on your own experience, your own history, what you've learned, how you interpret the data. We all know that if there's five people standing on the same corner and they all look at an accident, the police will give five totally different reports of what happened because everybody sees different things, is focused on different things, interprets things differently. Our whole reality is like that. So we talked about this person that you might say makes you angry. Well, it's how you interpret that. You might not interpret that rudeness as a terrible slight towards you, you might interpret it as somebody having a problem and a difficulty, and uh, they might need some help. Or maybe there's something you could do. So you can interpret it differently. So, one, we create our own reality by how we interpret. The second thing, which is a, is a kind of an obvious thing, we make our own reality by what we do, our interaction. What I do gives you new choices because now I've just changed your reality a little bit because I've done something. You know, I've parked my car across your driveway and you can't get out. You see, I've done something and now it puts new choices for you. So we're all creating choices for each other all the time. So we create our own reality by how we interact. So if I interact, as a very domineering, abusive, I just wanna, I, the only reason that I interact with you is because I wanna know what you can do for me and how I can use you for my own benefit, you see? If that's the kind of person I am, I create a reality that's different, very different, than if I'm a person who's very caring and I interact with you because I, I w would like to help or just get to know you, you know, just share and that sort of thing. I create a different reality. So we create the reality we're in based on how we are. And then there's another way that we create our own reality, and that is because we are consciousness playing a virtual reality game, we can do all the things that consciousness can do, you see? We don't have to just stay here in this virtual reality game. When you're playing World of Warcraft or Sims, you can put down the mouse and get up and go to the kitchen and make a sandwich, right? You can go do something else. Okay, well, we can too. We don't have to be stuck, just tied, tethered to this one data stream. We're consciousness. We can roam the whole larger consciousness system. We can attach to different data streams if we want. We can even attach to two of them at the same time. You can be playing your elf and be eating your sandwich or talking to somebody and you can multi, you can parallel process. See, all these things are available to us as consciousness. And the way the system has set up this virtual reality, and we'll get into the mechanics of it a little later, I'm just giving you the overview 
without the mechanics now. The way it's set up is that we need feedback. Any good schoolhouse needs feedback. And you have to be able to quickly see the results of who you are, what you're doing, what you're about. So in this reality, we can modify the future probability with our intent. What that means is that the reality we all together, all of us, all of us humans together, the reality and all the critters too for that matter, the, we can create a reality by our, our interaction. Together, our intent creates the future. You see, we create this reality. Now, how does that work? So I'm going to go a little bit into some, some structure. But see, that's a very powerful thing, right? That you can use your intent to modify future probability. That's a very powerful idea, and it has lots of logical consequences. Here's how this virtual reality works in the mechanics of it, okay? If it's a good schoolhouse, then you have to have both an anticipation of what the students are going to do, you know, where they're going, and you have to have history, where your students have been and what they've done. Because if you don't have that, if you're just stuck in the middle, then every moment is fresh and brand new, you know, it's impossible to accumulate growth. And that's what we're here for, to accumulate growth, right? Become love. So in this schoolhouse, the system keeps track of what happened. And the way it does that is it keeps track of, remember, this is a computed reality. You have to keep remembering that because I know you keep forgetting it because it's just not the normal way you think. It's a computed reality. So it keeps track of everything that has happened and everything that could have happened and the probability that it might have happened. Okay, that's in the, that's the past. This simulation I'm talking about, you see, is not a deterministic simulation. People who think in terms of simulation, like World of Warcraft, is a deterministic simulation. It had to be programmed. In the World of Warcraft, if you take this step, if you do this thing, under these conditions, you'll always get pretty much the same answer back. Except World of Warcraft has random number generators. So if you go into a battle and you swing your battle axe, well, you go to the random number generator and you bring out a number to see how well you did. You see? So it has, that's not repeatable. So there is, there is that in World of Warcraft, but we have that same thing to a much greater extent because our reality is a probabilistic, statistical reality. You see, there's too much information here to do this deterministically. You don't need a server, you don't need a computer to track every elementary particle in the universe and exactly what it's doing and how it's interacting. See, that's a deterministic simulation where every particle and what it's doing, you know, is this, you know, you know, this hydrogen atom, you know, this proton and this electron, you know, they're in this proximity and they're connected with this by the rule set, so one is, is orbiting the other, and you don't have to deal with it at that level. You only have to deal with the level that produces a data stream that puts you in the game. You see, you don't need to compute things that don't end up in somebody's data stream. There's a lot of logical consequences of that, too. I don't know, if you're thinking as, the, as we go, you realize that's really a, a big difference. Okay, for instance, um, we're all sitting in here and we all assume that, you know, we have brains in our head, but nobody's brain is coming in anybody else's data stream. You know, you can't, you can't see each other's brains. All you see is hair, and you, know, you don't even see skulls that much, you, or even the skin on your head. Mostly we just see hair. Well, that means there's no data in our data stream to define the skull, the skin on the top of your head, or your brain, or any of your internal, internal organs. None of those have to be defined. 
You only have to define what's in the data stream, you see? Now, we have to act as if we had a brain, as if we had internal organs, as if there were oxygen in the air, and that has to be probable. Okay, according to our rule set, which derives our biology, then in order for us to be here and interacting, we have to have a brain and central nervous system and blood and all that sort of stuff. Okay, it's, so it's probable that all we have all that stuff and it's working, right? But it doesn't have to be computed all the time. You only have to compute what you see. No more. Same with the Sims. Okay, exactly the same with the Sims. So we, that's a, that's kind of a major idea. So there doesn't, the system does not have to simulate, well, I should say simu it simulates it, but it doesn't have to create any oxygen in this room for us to breathe. It only has to have the probability that there's oxygen in this room, you see? So now if we go out and burn down all the rainforests, you know, kill all the plankton in the ocean, and we no longer have oxygen, then we'll all start to cough and sputter and fall over because there no longer will be probable that there's oxygen in this room, and we, this is a probabilistic simulation. But because there's plenty of plankton, and because all the rainforests haven't been destroyed yet, and because there's a lot of greenery around, and uh, you know, photosynthesis, and green things producing oxygen for us, the probability that there's plenty of oxygen in this room is close to one. So, we all can just sit here and breathe, but no oxygen needs to be computed. You see, only the probability of oxygen needs to be computed, and that's a lot simpler. Otherwise, somebody has to keep track of, a, you know, a trillion oxygen molecules bouncing around, you know, all over the planet. Well, that's obviously not a good idea. This computer simulation that consciousness has done is very economical. It's not a dumb simulation. It's, it's, it's very economical, very parsimonious, as they say, in that world. Okay, well, have I given everybody a headache yet? Are we, are we uh, everybody doing okay? Uh, don't, I'm putting an awful lot out, you know, an awful lot that's very contrary to any way you've thought before, but it'll get easier as we, as we go. So that's the way a virtual reality is. Let me talk a little bit more about virtual reality. Not only do we not have to, does the virtual reality not have to produce oxygen or blood in your veins or a brain in your head, because none of that shows right now. All it needs to produce for you is a data stream that shows you what you're interacting with, just like your elf. That's all. When you're in that, that world of Warcraft and you look to the east and you see the mountains and the forest, you don't know what's behind you. This is the same right now. Your data stream contains me and you know this paper and these flowers and all that, but it doesn't contain those delicious looking snacks in the back. It doesn't contain that wall back there. That's not in your data stream because you're not looking that way. You're looking this way. So for you, there is no data describing that. Well, there's all the rest of this world out here and none of that data is being you know, put in your mind either because you're just here looking at me and this is all the data you get and you're getting the data from my voice and you're processing that. Other people, the people who are driving those cars out there, their data stream is different. They're not hearing any of this. They're operating a car and seeing traffic and road and their data stream is entirely different. Their reality is different. We all live in our own individual reality. Okay. But it's a shared reality. It's a multiplayer game. So their cars go by and we sit in here and that's okay because we can see them and they can probably look over and see the building and that's all that we need to do. So it's the same with your elf and the barbarian and the magic users and all the other people that wander around in that, in that video game. It's the same way. They can see each other when they're close to each other and when they're looking in that direction. They can interact and when they're not close to each other and don't interact, they're not in each other's data stream. See. So a little, a little uh, uh, example I like to use just because it's fun to illustrate the virtual reality and how it works. 
uh, well, there's a couple of them. One of them is, so here's, here's the way it works. You have a, an astronomer, say. Now, we don't know a whole lot about the larger universe that we live in because we can't see that far. And just recently, we've had some new telescopes like Hubble and other things that give us new insights to what it looks like. So let's say that one of these uh, astronomers, astrophysicists, has got this brand new nifty telescope that's going to allow him to see maybe in a frequency band or a distance or something that nobody's looked in before. Okay, so he, the, microscope, or the telescope gets monitored and he gets ready and he puts his eye to the piece. Of course, it doesn't work that way anymore. That's just a metaphor. You know, you don't have eyepieces and look at things so much anymore as it's all computer data. But anyway, we'll pretend he does. And he looks in this eyepiece and he looks out there and he sees something. Well, what does he see? The way it works is that Nobody's ever looked there before, so we don't know what's there. Well, what's probable to be there? Well, out there in outer space, you know, there could be maybe a thousand different things that might be there. Who knows? Each of those things has a probability. What's the probability of it being a nebula? Or what's the probability of it having uh, been just an exploded, you know, red dwarf? Or what's the probability that it could be any of those things or nothing at all, just a blank piece of space? Well, when he looks, the system needs to provide him with some information in his data stream. This is the simulation he's in. So it goes to the probabilities it reaches up into all the things that are probable, and they're in a distribution. So if, this is, if some things are more probable than others, then it's more likely you'll just pick those randomly out of the distribution. That's what we mean by a statistical distribution. I can explain that a little more later if it confuses you, ask a question. But a random draw from the distribution of the probabilities is pulled out, and that's what goes in his data stream. That's what he sees. Now. There's this rule that says that once the data has gotten here, we have to keep it consistent. So now everybody else that goes in and looks at that same spot, that same telescope, is going to see the same thing because the probability, we say the, the wave function has collapsed to a physical thing and now it's in this now it's in this reality frame. So you can't have different people looking at different times, seeing different things, that wouldn't that wouldn't do. That'd be an inconsistent reality. So that's what he gets. It's just a random draw. And we will find a little later that all of reality works that way. So here's another one. A man goes, you know, a man walks up to a forest, and this forest is a forest that nobody's ever been. At least we don't know that anybody's ever been there. It's just some new place we discovered on the planet somewhere. And somebody walks up to this forest. Well, what are they going to see? Again, it's just probability. So they walk up to the woods and open their eyes, and there it is. They get a woods. Now, there's lots of probabilities. Depending on their altitude, they may get palm trees or they may get birch, you know, depending on where they are. And all these affect the probabilities. Random draw is taken out of the probability distribution, and that's what he sees. Okay, so let's say he sees a bunch of deciduous trees with leaves on them, and there happens to be a, a tree that's obviously dead, that's standing here, it's kind of wobbly, it's just mostly the trunk left and a few branches, and it's not uh, too stable. He notices that, he looks around, and he leaves. Let's say he goes away, and he comes back five years later. Walks into the same place in the woods, and looks. And now what does he see? Well, similar, kind of looks sort of like it did before, except now that one that was dead that was barely standing is lying on the ground. Now you're thinking, oh, it fell over. It didn't fall over. That's because you believe in a objective world. What happened is the probability when he came back five years later was that it would have fallen over because the probability of storms and winds and you know, continuing rot and the rest of it made it highly likely that it would fall and over. So when he goes back the second time and he looks, out comes the probability, but now it's constrained to be similar, you know, to be connected to what he saw before. He can't suddenly fall out a bunch of palm trees when there were deciduous trees there before, you see, because once in here, you have to maintain consistency. But now he pulls out a draw of what he sees and 
That tree is lying on the ground. It didn't have to fall. When he looked once, it was standing up. When he looked again, it was on the ground. Probability changed. That's all. It's we who assume, because we believe in this as an objective reality, that it fell over in the meantime. See, that's the old, if a tree falls in the woods and there's nobody there to see it, you know, uh, did it make a sound? Well, you know, there really is no woods and there is no tree. It's all just probability and data. So at one time he sees it this way, the next time he looks he sees it that way. Now, in our world, that seems really, really strange because we have this belief about this physical reality. But when you get to the, oh, I'm being given the, okay, we'll come back, we're gonna talk a little bit about how this ties up with science. Science verifies all the things that I'm telling you. I'm still a physicist, even though I sound a little crazy, right? But science, verifies all this, and it turns out that this very theory we're talking about, about consciousness, allows us to derive science. We can derive quantum mechanics from first principles, which traditional scientists cannot do. We can derive relativity from first principles, which traditional physicists cannot do. The science just falls out. Physics falls out as a logical consequence of our understanding of consciousness. Isn't that interesting? And we'll see a little about where that goes after the break that I've probably terribly overrun.